Let me welcome you all to uh, this uh, new installation here. I'm Ramesh Rao. I direct the UCSD division of Cal IT2. Uh, I was flattered that I was asked to say a few words, uh, mostly fluff. Uh, uh, the real wisdom will come from this uh, extraordinary panel that we have here. I was going to start by saying I'm probably the only engineer in the room, but uh, Lee uh, <laughs> uh, not only is an engineer, but he created uh, the School of Engineering here uh, years ago. Uh, before he retired. Uh, I'm delighted that the gallery at Cal IT2 continues to uh, keep the installations going. Uh, we've all come to expect uh, some very sort of innovative, unique ways of using technology. But for me personally, what I have learned uh, and benefited the most at a personal level uh, is listening to the artists talk about what they are doing. You know, it's just amazing. Um, uh, Today's installation is uh, Tijuana, San Diego, Cooperation and Confrontation at the Interface. And I was, I was looking at it and thinking, Cooperation and Confrontation at the Interface could well be what Cal ID2 stands for. Uh, that's exactly what this enterprise is all about. Uh, and I'm amazed at how often artists seem to be able to anticipate the larger issues that we have to grapple with uh, from their observations of what goes on. So. I'm really looking forward to uh, learning uh, uh, as this uh, discussion today evolves, as well as uh, sort of immersing myself uh, in the installations. Uh, maybe we'll learn something new about cooperation and confrontation at the interface. We'll need even more of this uh, as we sort of find a way to deal with what awaits us uh, in the state economy here. So thank you. Okay, uh, I am uh, the moderator. My name is Eduardo Navas, and uh, it is uh, quite an honor to uh, moderate the panel this uh, evening. Uh, actually, uh, it is uh, the first time that I get to. Okay. I hope you're all turning the phones off. It should be, should I? Okay. So um, it is. Uh, the first panel that I'm able to actually attend. I've seen the other ones online, and I don't know if uh, anybody knows about um, my relationship to the gallery, but I, I, I started, I helped start the, the vision that, that uh, Ramesh and others had uh, as, as part of the committee at that time, that the people who were in that committee, I was the coordinator, and so for me it's quite special to be, finally be able to, to be here in real life as opposed to watching the video streams uh, uh, from far away. So, um, uh, and it's really great to see that the, the program is rolling along, so um, I'm, I'm very, very happy about that. So today we have uh, the panel for um, the current exhibition, which is the Juana San Diego Corporation and Confrontation at the Interface. And uh, what I'm going to do is just say very briefly uh, a little bit about the exhibition and um, introduce the panelists. And each of them will just come up and, and speak for a few minutes about their um, particular projects. Um, I think it's quite interesting to have this um, uh, exhibition at a time when we're having we, we this relationship with Mexico and the frictions with the, the, the politics in terms of war of, of the drug wars and so forth. So, I think um, it is it is a, a perfect uh, exhibition for reflection on on uh, the never ending uh, um, issue that recurs uh, at the border. So. Um, we have four um, partic uh, well four uh, installations or sets of works that are uh, part of this exhibition, and uh, I'm going to start by just mentioning each of them, and then they'll just come up. The first one, uh, it's not going to be so much in the order of the exhibition list that you see up there, but more in the order that they're going to come up to the podium and speak about their work. The first one is uh, uh, UCSD uh, Visual Arts Professor Fred. Lodinier, uh, uh, the title of the piece is NAFTA's number 15, Rio Tijuana Bridge, A Tale of Two Globes, or Two Tales of a Globe, in Spanish, would be Puente de Rio Tijuana, Un Cuento de Dos Mundos, o Un Cuento de Un Mundo. And um, the, the project is contextualized as providing a representation of the problematics of globalization from the perspective of the organized efforts by workers to make gains in labor rights and conditions of employment. The next panelist would be uh, former dean of uh, UCSD 
School of Engineering, as we just heard, um, uh, Lee Rudy, whose photographs document the uh, Tijuana River's path across the border, revealing its many roles as drainage creek, city water supply, border crossing, obstacle, and preserved salt marsh. And uh, after uh, Lee Rudy, we'll have Jose Ignacio Lopez Ramirez Gaston. Uh, that's the installation inside the gallery. The title of his piece is 24 Speakers and 24 Sound Sources. Um, which are deployed in the interior of the gallery uh, to enact the concept of democratization of knowledge and, and reverse migration in the use of technology. And finally, we'll have Media Womb, um, which is a collaboration uh, from artists uh, in the project Kubo or Kubo Project. I see Felipe made it, so <laughs> I'm glad he, he did. Uh, the uh, collective includes uh, Giacomo Castagnola, Camilo Ontiveros, Nina Weisman, and uh, Felipe Zuniga with uh, programming from Marios Chevella. Is that correct? Okay. So uh, now I'll leave you with uh, Professor Fred Lodier, and he'll talk about his work. And we advance the slide by just. Uh, oh, yes, just uh, here. Yeah. And this is. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, have uh, been doing uh, works essentially about the class struggle from a labor perspective uh, and as a union member since the mid-70s, but uh, in the mid-90s uh, because of people that I knew, uh, including some former students of UCSD who were doing uh, labor rights work in the Maquiladoras, I was able to go down and uh, and uh, 30 miles south and take the project uh, in that direction and have been doing so ever since. And in fact, it's a growing uh, project. And uh, this is a, an early version of, the, of a piece that I call NAFTA, uh, Not a Fair Trade for All. And uh, this was at the uh, Autonomous University, uh, allegedly, uh, in, uh, near the airport in Tijuana. And uh, I was invited to have this. This is the uh, theater uh, gallery. And the earlier version of the work was mostly in English. And so the translations, as you can uh, see, are provided sort of like butterfly wings. But uh, later versions of the work, the entire panels were in both Spanish and English. Uh, I am myself monolingual and so have relied upon hiring uh, work-study students at UCSD, uh, of which there are many who qualify for student aid and have been able then to uh, go down with someone who could translate and, uh, and then uh, uh, interviews that I did and then translate those uh, into English and transcribe them and transcribe texts. Uh, the work that's in the show today was a much later piece that's out in the hall. It's a long uh, work on the Tijuana Bridge. Uh, it's the overpass as you go directly south from San Isidro uh, into Tijuana. And uh, uh, it is uh, <clears throat> largely two texts uh, in Spanish and English that had to be translated, and they deal uh, very significantly with uh, globalization. And... Uh, were, was kind of a back burner piece that I had started uh, quite a number of years ago and, uh, and uh, would be distracted by, by some struggle that I would attend to and document, do some video work, and then come back to and eventually I finished it in 2005 uh, in time for a, a show I had in Canada. And so um, you'll see that piece, of course, when you get out. It's the only one that I've, I printed out in vinyl, and uh, which I kind of liked. Uh, but the uh, context of my work is uh, that the work is really designed not so much for the art gallery or, or even the art world, except to engage in discourses around documentary. Uh, but the work is really designed uh, to, to be in uh, union halls or community spaces where people uh, uh, have an interest in these things, particularly the labor movement is a primary audience. Uh, I hope by... Uh, it's basically pedagogical intent and trying to provide things 
that the labor movement, I think, does not do that well to educate. Uh, there's a kind of public relations way that the labor movement does education, and I like to get actually into the details of it, including, uh, uh, to some extent, even things that might be even critical of the labor movement, uh, but from a pro-union uh, point of view. And so um, I don't know what else to say uh, this show, except that this show was censored. Uh, it was, I got some money, a little bit of money for the opening and also to print up some leaflets and it took a little while to get that together and uh, when I did, I hired a couple of uh, guys I knew in Tijuana to go out. Uh, this gallery, uh, out the double glass doors in the front, uh, uh, there are maquiladoras right across the street. And uh, Huabase services the maquiladora industry in a very significant way. A large number of its graduates going lawyers, uh, secretaries, uh, technicians of all kind. And, uh, and the leaflets invited uh, uh, maquilador workers to come see the show and they were taken out the uh, largest and oldest industrial zone is just two miles uh, east. Well, the minute those hit the uh, hit the zone, why they went right inside the plant and up the chain of command and next thing you know I got an email uh, uh, came in on a Friday morning for a committee meeting and I just thought I'd check my email only to find out that my show had been taken down. And the reason was that uh, that it, they claimed that it was a political art and there were some allegations made. Well, the show had been up for a month and already and uh, the the community at Wabase was quite happy with the show. I got invited to, to two different classes. So it was the invitation for workers to come that was really at stake, and the implication was that it came from the Maquiladora Association, uh, that they had called and complained about the about the show, and so here was a, a university, you know, associated academic freedom, uh, industrial uh, obligations, academic freedom, and uh, academic freedom, uh, uh, artistic freedom lost uh, in that. And so they censored the show. Uh, but I called the, the Union Tribune, and they, they did a nice article. It went out uh, quite, a, quite a ways. Uh, one of the problems with censorship is it can quite backfire. Uh, the uh, David Avalos, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, not David Avalos, but um, oh shoot, it'll come back to me. But I, but the uh, <clears throat> uh, people at the Centro Cultural de, Ra de la Raza decided to respond to the censorship and uh, uh, gave me a show with Casa Sola, the, the Mexican documentarian of the of the Mexican Revolution. So I think that's enough for now, and uh, welcome again, and uh, hopefully we'll have a nice, in, uh, vigorous discussion with you. Bye. And now we have, uh, you, you heard you. Thanks. Thank you. I was afraid to touch it and hit the wrong button. Everything crashed. Uh, I was involved in the uh, in the startup of an organization that was started at UCSD called San Diego Dialogue that dealt with a number of civic issues, and one of them had to uh, was about cross border issues. And actually, they accomplished a lot. It's and uh, but during this time, I was on the mailing list for a lot of talks around UCSD about border issues, and one of them over at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies was on the Tijuana River because, if, in fact, it it's drains about equal amounts of land on either side of the border. It's, uh, there are three, two reservoirs on the U U.S. side, one on the Mexican side that provide a lot of drinking water to San Diego and to Tijuana, respectively. Then, it, as you well know, it goes through the middle of Tijuana and becomes largely a drainage ditch, and then it uh, wanders across the border, and there it becomes a famous nature preserve where that uh, uh, bird watchers come from all around the country to go look at it. So it starts in wilderness in the mountains and ends in a nature preserve and does a lot of things in between. So the reason I picked this picture out, so there are 12 images in there, in there and uh, 
this is uh, was actually historically the for this show the first one I took. Uh, I parked on this berm. I'd never seen this part of the river. I walked up to the end of the fence there with a uh, medium format camera uh, on a tripod, and sitting at the end of the fence was a vehicle from the uh, Border Patrol. And they asked me what I was doing. I told them I was taking pictures. And they said, they checked with their superior and said, well, that's okay. And they uh, then they pointed over across the way, and there was this big crowd of people, mostly guys, and, uh, on the other, opposite side, and they all had uh, uh, z- baggies over their feet for water protection. And in, they said in about eight minutes, they're all going to come running across. And I said, why is that? Because we're going to leave. They didn't have overlap of their shifts. So I'm sitting there with this camera, a very wide-angle lens camera, on my tripod, and sure enough, the truck leaves, and suddenly I'm absolutely surrounded by running uh, people who were getting into the U.S. And uh, how many of them stayed on the other side, on our side? How many got caught? I don't have any idea, but in about five minutes, the, the next shift arrived, and that was it. It was all over. So this is the only one that has a really uh, unusual story. The rest are sort of conventional uh, landscapes that were taken starting. If you look at the list of the, they're ordered from picture one in the upper left to picture 12 in the lower right, and that's in the order of elevation. So they start at the headwaters and end up at the mouth down by the ocean. So I'll be uh, happy to discuss any of them with you, uh, either in the discussion or later on at the opening. Thank you very much. Uh, Next we have uh, Jose Ignacio Lopez, Ramirez Gaston. Sorry, I just want to hear the music for a second. It's the music that is the music that uh, gets automatically assigned to video in, in a program that we use. But um, so, in uh, on 9/11, I was in LA, and you know, heard the news, and then immediately we got into a car and started driving south, and the whole highway was abandoned. There was nobody, right? And we got into Tijuana. There was nobody at the border, and then. Uh, that only ha- that not only happened that day, but people stopped crossing the border slowly. And then we got the drug war, violence. Finally, we got the shrine flu, and who, I don't know what else is going to be, you know, coming soon. But then people stop crossing the border, and you get places like Rosari- Rosarito that is completely abandoned, uh, Avenida Revolución that is kind of abandoned, which I don't think is such a bad thing after all, and, and other areas of the city that get abandoned because people don't cross the border because people are afraid of crossing the border. And even on the process of talking about uh, um, this uh, exhibition and talking about the installation that I was doing, I talked to some people. I said, like, hey, you just come to Tijuana. And it's like, well, you know, I'm kind of, you know, they would say, no, I'm afraid to cross the border, you know, and I think... Uh, Probably the amount of people getting killed, of foreigners getting killed during this whole process is probably one maybe, in, or one that I don't know of probably, or, or two maybe. So, uh, but then the whole thing is that there's there's has always been a really horrible black myth about Tijuana, and you know it continues to to exist now. And uh, so it's really difficult to talk about uh, cooperation or confrontation when you have these uh, kind of situation which people are afraid of crossing to a country that is right there, right? So what I try to do with this installation is a little bit of bringing a little bit of Tijuana to San Diego and bringing a little bit of Tijuana to Cal 82, which, uh, and I really thank Cal 82 for letting me do this and, and for organizing this uh, this exhibition because it's my opportunity to bring the kind of environment that I, that I deal with on a daily basis and the kind of world that I like 
which is Tijuana, and uh, and and bring the logic, the survival strategies, the uh, um, the skills and the knowledge of a way that you might consider as not traditional thinking in Tijuana, because uh, in order to allow cooperation and participation, uh, you have to permit, understand, and, and allow people to talk in their own language, not to have some sort of a reception and translation of whatever their system of knowledge is and say, like, okay, talk about yourself, and this is the way you have to talk about yourself. So what I'm doing is kind of a, um, I don't know what's the word, a, a macabre version of a sound architecture, and it's based on uh, the sound architectures of Leitner, um, which is a famous um, sound artist that would do these installations uh, with, let's say, I know, 50 speakers in a space, and you have a beautiful space with a whole bunch of speakers, and say, well, I'm going to kind of try to play and see how it, uh, how it sounds. And then in this case, it's kind of the other way around. I'm going to get 50 or, well, in this case, 24 used speakers on the streets. They're all completely different. Each one has, produces a different sound, has a different power, has different qualities. I'm going to buy them on the streets, put them together on a structure that is uh, actually... <clears throat> Uh, structure that I built in Tijuana with the help of some people at the street markets and I'm going to build it here, I'm going to put the speakers and I'm going to use a sounds, uh, source, uh, sources of sound, things that I buy also on the street and see you know, how I managed to do with this situation and generate some sort of a spatialization system in quality too and, uh, and it, was, it was also some sort of a nostalgic uh, logic behind it because uh, when I was a kid I grew up in Peru and when I grew up in Peru, I didn't really have access to technology. So, for example, my first uh, guitar microphone was a collection of about 10, uh, 10 headphones, you know, 10 broken up headphones. A friend of mine put them all together, wired them together, and that was my, uh, my uh, guitar uh, pickup. I hooked it up on the stereo in the house, and that's how we uh, play guitar, and I had a band. And... and to be honest, uh, I remember those times with a lot more happiness than, you know, the future times when I was able to buy a really cool guitar. It was a lot of fun. Um, so somehow this installation is about, well, that would be the opposite version of a Tianguis in, in uh, this is San Diego, like super organized, perfectly clean San Diego street market. And what you saw before is, is the Tijuana market. Um, so... Then my idea was to uh, to try to, maybe on a personal note, try to regain that understanding that at some point had when I was younger about the use of technology and the real application of technology uh, for my real needs. And, and it was uh, my expectations when I was younger were way uh, fewer than my expectations related to technology now. And it was also a contrast with what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm doing a PhD in computer music. Right, so I'm, I'm doing the whole technology thing, and then so I wanted to go back a little bit to the low tech logic and the strategies of survival of environments that start right here, you know, a few meters from us, and and that are common to all Latin America probably. And um, so that's the general idea of the of the installation. We build it in uh, we build it in Tijuana on the street, and then we I smuggle the materials to San Diego, speakers sound sources, uh, structure, etc., etc., and install it right here. I think it's a... I don't want to talk too much. I'd rather have some comments and some conversation here with you guys. And uh, so I guess that would be all. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, the Collective Kubo. Giacomo uh, Castagnola, Camilo... Good evening, I'm Camilo Ontiveros, and um, I'm, uh, a, I graduated UCSD in 2006 and recently graduated uh, UCLA 
uh, my, my MFA. Uh, I think uh, I can start talking about how Kubo Project started. And uh, my pra in my practice, uh, I've been doing a lot of collaborations and opening up spaces, uh, co-founding spaces like Luis Velasquez, uh, Imprenta, and in Nomar, which was started here in UCSD, but also uh, with Felipe Zuniga started uh, this wonderful project called Kubo, and uh, that was back in 2007, and we kind of did some projects in Tijuana and in, in L.A., uh, and uh, after an invitation to Gallery 727 in L.A., uh, both Felipe and I started talking about kind of how we were going to move on with this project. And we invited uh, Giacomo and Nina, since we were all kind of working in similar practice, uh, dealing with uh, sound, uh, Tijuana, uh, border issues, and but also uh, just kind of have the, the we, we kind of have the, uh, wanting to be collab collaborating uh, in some sort of project. So that's when Media Womb started through a sort of conversations and, and uh, dialogues. Okay. Hi. G good evening. My name is Felipe Zuniga. I'm also part of Cubo. I wanted first to thank UCSD, Caletti 2, and Trish Stone, and, and Ricardo Dominguez for trust. Uh, with this project, and I would you give you a very quick, quick frame that to extend what Camilo started to say. Um, Kubo was uh, started as uh, an exercise of, of uh, extending the notion of being um, object-based practices to try to inquire about social space, architecture, performance, sound, uh, design and technology. Uh, we had a first version that was uh, Camilo's uh, piece that produced and presented uh, for his graduation thesis uh, undergrad show. And the idea of this sound structure um, that was like, uh, this was like this great sculpture that projected sound. We were thinking about how to turn that sound sculpture and turn it into like a platform for collaboration, like a, an open mic, sort of. So from that, we start working with people um, in Tijuana also, but in Mexico City and with uh, Nacho. I mean, we build like a wide range of, of collaboration around uh, poetry, sound, and the notion of Tijuana as um, pretty much like, I guess, celebratory space to, to experience. So we invited around like 20 artists and between musicians, writers, to produce sound pieces. So this structure was presented first in Tijuana, then we moved to LA, and then there the project turned into radio, the experience of radio and participation again, and the idea to extend the idea of open mic. And uh, we invited Michael Trigirio and Micah Cardenas, and again Nacho, to try to produce a sort of performance, commu community-based performance, turning a um, shelter into a, a radio station and a gallery uh, into a radio station and play with with that with all the not only the sound and performativity that happened either in the shelter or in the gallery but also to try to cross um, discourses as interactions with people that either don't go to art or that uh, that don't think about art like as an option or art turn it into more uh, community based or social aware um, notion and um, I'll open, yeah, that's the former versions of Google. And we started talking about uh, Media Woman, and I'll leave Nina and Giacomo to, to extend. Um, because of this phenomenon, we suffered last year, between November and December, this uh, very particular violent uh, way. And uh, there was this uh, very upsetting situation that being living in Tijuana and having all these representations about the place that you live and experience. Um, we were trying to think how to transcend this uh, kind of flow of information that paralyzes you and uh, that uh, also denies a lot of aspects as the ones Nacho is pointing at, like how social space and basically like life 
keeps in the flow even though under these very hard circumstances. So the idea was to open a dialogue to depart from violence but not to get stuck into violence but to extend through artistic practice and to try to build a kind of like network of flow and collaboration between art and social space and media representation. Hello, I'm Nina Weissman, and um, yeah, thank you to Cal IT2 for hosting us. Um, uh, so yeah, Felipe and Camilo uh, yeah, invited uh, Yako and I to participate. Um, they, um, we were interested in, so as, as Felipe was saying, in expanding uh, the representations of Tijuana from this sort of monomaniacal presentation in the media, which is only focused on the sensational crimes that are taking place there. Um, we wanted to complicate that by bringing in sounds of everyday life. Um, and they invited me. I had already created a piece and had a, a fairly large archive of sounds gathered from all over Tijuana um, of people working, playing, doing things in the street and in their homes that were keeping the city going in the face of the economic blockade that's been created by people's fears of crossing, um, among other reasons that it exists. Um, so uh, so a couple of interests that I had in this piece, um, well, uh, that we all had in the piece were to um, make, uh, we're all consuming uh, media all the time, um, and these, these, as I was saying, these sensational representations of Tijuana and the drug problems, um, we wanted to make this uh, um, felt bodily. Uh, and so um, I used sensors, which are usually used at the border to isolate people, um, to instead uh, create a sort of uh, conduit that would um, it sort of enhance one's bodily consumption of images on both sides of the border. Uh, so, so there was this. So, you have on one side of the media room, we have sounds of the sort of sensationalist uh, reporting on the border, um, with the places and names separated into one sensor to sort of uh, enhance this point that this drug, these drug problems are global. They're not unique to Tijuana. Um, and uh, there's a separate sensor for the sort of sensational sounds of surveillance and, and control that are used, uh, sirens and helicopters and so on. Um, and on the opposite side, there are seven sensors with uh, lots of local sound. And so on that side, you have a lot more control over sort of creating a portrait of Tijuana that's much more complex um, than if you were to sit on the media side where you're primarily fed uh, these streams of information. Um, by moving your body, you can, as you saw us doing in that video, um, you can change the pitch, the speed, the spatialization of the sound. So there is really an active, potentially active bodily engagement with the creation of a different kind of portrait of Tijuana. Um, so I, uh, I hope you'll ask more questions about that after. Thank you. Hi. I'm Giacomo Castagnola. I'm an architect and designer. For, I, I'm Peruvian born, but I, I live and work in Tijuana for like six years. And well, the team already introduced the piece in the general context. But uh, Felipe and Camilo invite me sort of to, to develop this, the, at least the physicality of the piece, because I used to work in that things. And um, very, Try to synthesize. Uh, my, from, from, for me, it was very familiar to live in Tijuana because it's, I born in, in Lima, and Lima is, is 80% sort of informal uh, uh, city growth, as Tijuana it is. And sort of my, my behave in the uh, sort of working and living uh, system is very, very similar than in Tijuana. And that's why I start to get involved to the city very easily. Basically, focusing, try to develop public space from a very sl uh, small, um, let's say, not connected to the state or any institution, more to the, try to bring middle scale object furniture to develop some kind of public space in the street. And I make different projects. I think this have, I, I mentioned this because I think the, the womb have this particularity related to the scale, sort of an in between between a share that is very personal or body base and uh, and, uh, and a little space sort of in between a share and a space and it's, I think this in between scale is very familiar in this kind of informal cities like a curry a taco stand thing Can you stop this yeah. oh you want to stop? yeah like a taco stand thing or every movable uh, retail thing and the other, the other interesting for me, and I think it's very clear in the in the piece, is the materiality, and the construction, uh, not only not only the construction but sort of the matter, 
how this how the boom is is uh, made all from the same material. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what's happening here. Where do you want? Do you want to run? Like put it big. <laughs> okay. I'll do it. You talk. Okay. <laughs> oh well, this is another. Thank you. Uh, well, the the third the the old one is the middle scale public space. Start to develop public space with a let's say furniture space sort of between be, uh, in between scale, and the other is the modern. No? How the I think for, through the same process understanding the city. In the end, I understand this as a s accumulation of systems, different kinds of systems, even in architecture and in retail and in, in, in related to that kind of uh, cultures. And, and I think this piece has this, this uh, particular materiality very clear. Okay. And because you can see how through accumulation you can consolidate a, a body of work, I think I, I, you can make an, an analogy of the city, of how the, the city works. It's not, a, it's not neither a pre-design, we build it sort of through, put it together. Uh, Camilo, Igor, Felipe write very interesting thing about how this turns more in like a performer, performer way to, to develop the form instead of pre-design, was sort of to accumulation with sort of related to the gravity, the site, this will be the form, and I think uh, this will be the two things I can talk about this piece, no? Middle scales and pu public space and materiality and how the matter can mix information, accumulation, and stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 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 So we have, a, uh, we have about 20 minutes for discussion. Um, uh, any questions from the audience? Questions. Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Just um, um, really, uh, is she, I hope someone has a question now. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, I actually have a question um, regarding Hugo's uh, title, Media Work, and so if maybe you can elaborate on why rule as a second part. Also, I mean, I associate rule with. I can understand physically how it might want to encapsulate, but um, obviously we associate very maternal things with me. So if you can send the lovely and why. You should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, we, we do thought like um, the title, it's not as the piece, the whole thing, it's not a result of a pre preconception. Like we really just start working so and basically having these dialogues. And one thing, it's all of, uh, we had another image that was the Ouroboros, the serpent that eats its own tail. So we were uh, struggling between that image and then we thought about how um, the process making of the piece was related to this, uh, not necessarily um, a representation of, of the womb, but it does have this physicality that encapsulates you, but also by, by all these um, actions that produce form that then are transformed, then that linked also to the, the concept of womb. And, in, uh, and also because we had all this struggle since we were dealing with media representation and we were very, 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 um, Seek of you know border, border wars, blood in the river, or all these things that we were just constantly uh, getting. So we were, how can we just displace? Even though we're talking about this this issue, how can we redirect our attention to the process and to the fact that we are all collaborating and working together? And I hope that answers the question. Someone else? Uh, well, we have another. Another possibility of the title, but with the, uh, we have another uh, possibility of the title in the beginning. Um, I propose this only to, to figure out if really we are talking about violence or if that was the main concern, and was some particular phrase related to the narco cartels. And we was playing the same the same game. Now we are talking about violence, but how to deal, how to do, don Jews or how to do confuse in the process and in the end is to continue doing the same as, as, the, as the, I don't know, the news in Tijuana, not to sell violence as a main target. 
and and I think that's it. Another question? Yes. I have a question for Lee. Um, so, just about how you do the landscapes. I'm interested in because I yeah I think that landscape. I like landscape painting, I admit it, and I like landscape photography. And just I want to understand, when you go, do you, do you pre-select the sites? Do you walk around and then take the photos for, to illustrate a particular thing, or how do they happen? Well, first, I, uh, in this context, and being in Cal IT2, I'm embarrassed to say that all those color images were shot on Kodachrome, <laughs> not digital. Anyway, uh, historically, they were in the 90s. I, I would pick, uh, what I did was, uh, uh, when I had a day to devote to this, I'd pick a section of the river on one side of the border or the other and just go look around and study it for what struck me aesthetically as a photo op. And, um, you know, so, the, so there actually those images were over almost a decade where I'd spend a few days each year. Um, and I continued, I have some lower stuff for uh, much newer, but it isn't in this set of prints. This particular set of prints was first uh, shown at the faculty club, and then uh, I was invited uh, by the librarian to show them at the libra li UCSD library, but I knew there wasn't enough material of just my own, so I added two other photographers, Fred, uh, Phil, Phil Steinmetz from UCSD and a uh, Paul Ganster from UC, uh, from San Diego State, and um, so we had a show there. So this is the third time this particular set of prints has been shown, and they are actually in the permanent collection of the library. They're on loan to Cal IT2. Can I just add one thing about the room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't actually. Good. I guess I will. Um, yeah, I was uh, just recalling that, um, I mean, certainly when you look at this thing, yes, yeah, so the, there's the form of a womb, it, one is enclosed, and then you have all these veins and vessels of being, you're being fed media information. And so, um, on the one hand, there's a potential for a sort of passive experience in the, in the womb, um, but uh, uh, most people, it, one is encouraged to be active, but you see all these sensors. Um, uh, you know, a womb is a formative space. We wanted to make a, a um, sort of, create this possibility or point to this possibility of like a much more active consumption and, and just along those lines I, I just um, recently reading an interesting bit of theory about mirror neurons um, uh, where if, if a, it's like research on monkeys but if a monkey hears the sound of a nut cracking something it cares about it will actually um, brains will uh, neurons in its brain will fire exactly as if that monkey were cracking the nut himself and so, um, so maybe there, this idea of sort of feeding sounds of everyday life, which is what's happening on that one side of the room, it might be a kind of, you know, uh, let's say, not prenatal, but an ongoing um, feed of, of information that can perhaps like open a brain up to empathies with sounds it's not receiving normally. So. Uh, in front, yes. I, I'm wondering, back to the womb, if it, it was conscious or unconscious to use a protective, comforting, nurturing form to kind of counteract what the publicity has been across the border about the violence and the fear of crossing into Mexico. Um, related to related to the material, maybe that's the main uh, the aesthetic or the main uh, perception you have with the piece in the beginning. Uh, I, I did a, uh, another project before related to that material using is, is a pool molding process. Basically, they blended 80% newspaper. This is our Tijuana newspaper. And put water and mold it. That's a, the main process. And I did some furniture for the Museum Contemporary Art, I think, a year ago. And then I, when they invite me, I have this this idea to continue to use that material. And I think that's first first thing to realize, like this material is, you know, it's paper pulp coming, you know, for trees, it's a, the color is very ne neutral, it's not metal, it's different to sitting metal than sitting paper or to sitting wood, it's different feeling. That's only to realize the the perception of, of the, the, the piece. And the other thing is, 
I do furnitures. I am very aware of the body, how you engage with the with the object. And Camilo and Felipe and the group in, in general have in the beginning if they have some some particular idea was in the in the object uh, in a way try to develop an object to confront one person to each, to each other in front of each other and I think that's sort of the the beginning of how we decide or the piece ended uh, formally but the material was related to a, a non going research before I think that's the main feeling of the piece because it's very sort of uh, non aggressive because the material itself is not and the piece is pure material it's not a shape wholly it's not you know the, the and the a crate is very mundane sort of common thing but this formally it's very complex in a way it's very topologic it's kind of this piece is made by the accumulation of these units and that's what you can do with this unit without gluing, without nothing, only through the process of putting together. No? And I think that's another design sort of methodology exploration. But I think it's related to maybe to, ma to the matter itself and to the to the cocoon sort of no, middle space. No? Exactly, and an egg is protected within a womb. That's what. Yeah. I thought it was such a great metaphor. <laughs> yeah, but so this sort of a. Cocoon, uh, habitaculum is sort of a, yeah, womb is another word, but we can, you know, it's sort of this, uh, I think we, I was trying to think in this middle scale thing, like it's sort of, your body, scale body is very related to that, it's not on space, it's, it's already not a share, and this, is, this in between is, I think it's not very common as an object thing, and then I think that's another way of, why you perceive that thing, no? It's because you can go in, it's in a space, but in a way it's still just being a furniture and, and the material as well. No? Many dimensions to appreciate the piece. Well, I'd like to give a pitch to uh, follow us up on this uh, for a future seminar here at Cal IT, the, that's sponsored by Cal IT2. I get their, your monthly mailing email list and looking through it on November 6th, I think it is, it's a kickoff of a series on neuroscience and architecture, which is a joint venture of Cal IT2, the Salk Institute, and the uh, New School of Architecture downtown. Uh, Louis, you have a question? I guess this is a question, I guess, for anybody or everybody. Uh, I looked at the title and I saw the show, and then I looked, and then you spoke on the title. And I wonder about that title. It seems to me that. What it's really the show is about is different strategies of representation. Essentially, it's essentially a, a documentary show that takes various kinds of vectors of representation in terms of describing contemporary Tijuana, uh, whether it be or, or violence, or, or commodities. And so, in some way, I, I think it's really about representation. So, anybody here? Well, I uh, actually created that title, so you can blame it on the one engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the first proposal, uh, I, I wanted to stay away from the word border, which I think is, is uh, overused in this. So that's why I came up with the word interface, which Trish really liked, because it has some electronic uh, uh, Connotation. So you can blame me on the thing. I, I was surprised that the rest of the group that was solicited for titles accepted it. So I'd like to just make a comment here because it, it's, it's uh, the word violence has come up so much. I was kind of surprised, but uh, the violence is revolving around consumer goods. On the one hand, you have the hot violence that's associated with the drug trade. But on the other hand, you have the cold violence of being poisoned in the maquiladoras, of being injured, of being harassed. Uh, and there, uh, so there's a kind of a kind of interesting linkage there, but it's, it's the hot violence that gets the attention, right? It's, it's what makes the news. The cold violence around the world is, is what stays cool under the, uh, under the radar. The people, the disease, starvation, um, 
the, the working conditions of the, you know, makiladores are in, in Indonesia. The, the word maki, I don't know how you say that in, in Indonesian, but all over, over the planet, uh, special trade zones, uh, you know, instead of bringing immigrants into the United States, which is one way you can do it, and of course we, the United States is an immigrant country, or you can now, it's cheap enough and fast enough that you can send the factory uh, to, to the people. And uh, it all comes the same thing, though it's cheap labor, and it, and it's a kind of cold violence. And there's a, the whole issues of you know how do you, how do you intervene with that? What do you control it? And and in both cases, you know it's it's the consumer in the United States that that is at stake here. And and the, and the but the attention is always upon the the uh, you know the, the source of the drugs, where they come from, the cartels. Um, and, and so on. So I just I just wanted to make that kind of connection between hot and cold violence because I think they're both, you know, extremely well represented uh, in the show in a lot of ways. And the issues of pollution, of course, and 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 how the water is managed or unmanaged, uh, as it were, and and how much that border park has been poisoned incredibly by by the uh, policies of both countries of failing to come through with promises that that were made and so on. So I just wanted to. Few remarks about that. Um, I think also I just want to add that um, uh, yes, you know, you, you can talk about different kinds of representation, but I think all of the pieces have this sort of um, layering of the content is is about confrontation often, and the but the um, the way the pieces are framed or presented or the media forms that are used, uh, I, I seem to bring out our cooperation in these systems, you know, through our, you know, sort of. Um, happy consumption of the various, you know, products that are, that are, the products or the media that are at stake in the different pieces, you know, there's an implicit cooperation and I think all the pieces are trying to um, push, work on that edge, that friction between those two and, and, and I, th I think with some hope that people might think about where, what their place is in the cycle of cooperation and, and how they're, they're, com they're complicit with the confrontation, you know, um, if that makes sense. I just wanted to mention that the title came after the works, right? So the title is somehow a, an attempt to define how all these things kind of work together, and they do work together. So maybe right that you 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 could interpret it in a better way. Than, uh, but then the title came about, and then when the title came about, then I rethought of my work, and how my work could fit also the title. Yes. I have a question for Nacho. Nacho, how, how do you see your work functioning in relation to the audience? Because I understood from what you said that you are kind of recreating a certain social condition or a social space that has to do with sound and it has to do with architecture, informal architecture. Then when we go into the gallery, sometimes the sound is really overwhelming and sometimes the sound is not that, you know, how does one relate to the work here? To, to the work here in the gallery. In the gallery, um, well, there are many things. I, uh, for me, this uh, this installation has been kind of a process. I'm, I'm not really sure what it is yet, right? And I have changed my opinion many times about what it is about and what could be useful about it. And uh, I had an idea, I put it on paper, and then when I started installing, it became something else. So originally, the idea was a uh, uh, was interactivity, right? It's like 24 by 24. It's like the traditional kind of like representation of, you know, how many sources of sound, how many, how much control, kind of how can I control this sound and put it in different places, and I have the control in my hands. And there's a level that was important on that uh, interactivity, and, uh, but it started to change. Initially, I had, you know, many sources, and it, it changes every day, and I'm installing new things and, and, and changing, but uh, the problem that I had is uh, um, that uh, without the interactivity, I thought some, uh, some sort of an atmosphere was created that I kind of liked. So at some point I, I was thinking, you know, I, I'd rather have people not touch it. It was kind of funny because the whole thing was a little bit about interactivity. Then he was like, oh, it sounds kind of, sounds right. You know, it's kind of, this is a kind of right sound. Then people would come over and then they would change the radio stations because, you know, you can change the radio stations, you can change the TV, the only thing that you can really, and then you know, they would change, you know, the, the Hispanic radios for, uh, country radio or rock and roll radio or something like that and it would change completely the logic of the space and and as a 
you know, that, that was kind of interesting, and I like Elsa, and then every time I go in, and if they change it, I go back, right? So, so it's kind of interesting, because they, my original idea was this sort of inter the importance of this kind of interactivity, and then they real I realized that maybe, as you're saying, it, it works better as a, some sort of a representation, you know, or what I would consider a representation of a space that doesn't belong here, and I don't know if it, if it belongs here, and if it belongs here, how should people be allowed to, to, to transform it into something else or not? It's a really difficult question, and I'm still trying to figure out how... I don't even know if that was the question, but, but I wanted to say that, anyways. Okay, another question? All right, uh, we're, uh, it's, it's about five, but um, I just wanted to like maybe ask uh, something very quick. Um, one of the things that I think it's interesting about the um, pieces is that they all take from the space. I mean, all of them are about Tijuana, but uh, we're here, you know, uh, very comfortable, very comfortable uh, talking about it. And so um, I think one of the things that artists historically have struggled with is uh, their privileged position uh, as speakers for other people. I mean, these some people handle it differently. So I thought maybe I could ask each of you very briefly to, to uh, express how you feel about this and, like, how do you think that um, the discourse that we're sort of talking about here can be pointed back the other way or have it more open, uh, or if you see any possibilities for that at all? Uh, I mentioned before that uh, this show was at our library with two other photographers, and that collection was scheduled to be shown in Tijuana, and then through some and it was the uh, person at State who was organizing the, uh, uh, making the cross-border arrangements, and unfortunately something collapsed at the end and it never was shown there, but we were, we fully anticipated that it would be in Tijuana. Hmm. I just want to say that, uh, um, at least for me, it's not, it's not comfortable to talk about Tijuana. It's, it's a big problem, and, uh, and um, I have to, we have to deal constantly with all sorts of problems, and political problems, discrimination, uh, the natural inequality, violence at the border that you receive at the moment that when you're crossing the border. When I cross the border and I show my passport, and you know, I have to change my mode. I can't be like, hey, let me through. It's like, <laughs> what do you want to know? I'll tell you anything you want to know about me because I don't want to get in trouble. And I've been in trouble, I've been in, I don't know, in, in a room for a whole night with the migration officers insulting me and saying that they're gonna send me to jail and you know what happens to jail and that they're gonna rape me and something and then and these are the officers of the law or whatever it means but and or I have problems getting into a, a room for hours you know being insulted just because they're bored maybe right so this is not a, a, an easy issue right it's a very complex issue and it's really hard for me to talk about Tijuana but I, I try my best not to get into some sort of a, a very emotional argument about uh, daily problems and things like that, and because of the kind of environment maybe where we are, I just wanted to mention that it's not, a, mm -hmm. it's not quite a comfortable situation. Yeah. Uh, uh, Victor Ochoa, I'm sorry, is the person who <clears throat> brought my show to, to the uh, Central Cultural de la Raza. But, you know, my work is uh, maybe a little different in that it, it, it's documentary in the sense that it, there are interviews uh, in a lot of it with workers. I, I uh, uh, approach them as a member of a union. I approach them as a fellow worker. Uh, this is not typical of, of documentary artists. Uh, this is not typical of artists who who would go across to a different group and try to bring a message back. I call this sort of safari photography. Uh, there are, of course, differences between an academic like me, but, but I'm a delegate to the Central Labor Council. You know, I, I'm there as another member of another union uh, with, with machinists and, and, and so on. And so it isn't that those kinds of uh, relations and differences aren't problematic. But but it but at least it's contained within within a structure, an ideological whole, and an actual physical and, and and institutional structures, and so I think this is one of the problematics of artists, as as sort of the classical outsider, and, and many artists actually feel embrace that, 
and, it, and that, that that is a zone where one can be free, a zone where one can be truthful, and that that, that institutional connections are corrupting, and, and so on, which they can very well be. But on the other hand, it also produces a kind of built-in distance, and so I I'm, I'm trying to bridge that uh, uh, by that membership, by those uh, by those notions of solidarity. Uh, as a way across uh, those gaps and, and divides. Okay. One person from Cuba, if possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm an architect designer. I, in maybe in the design, you can at least uh, put the representation sometimes apart because you are building some stuff. Not that it's not necessarily need to be narrative. Um, I think this is maybe the first piece I made out of out of Tijuana. Talk about Tijuana. Normally, I, I can say not everybody talk about. It. I try to never talk about Tijuana as a subject because I assume I live there, I work there, uh, I embedded with the whole system, and I represented Tijuana, whatever I do there. And I think that's the way at least the womb is made. Doesn't represent Tijuana as a representation object thing. The sound and, the, and, and the, all the activity is, I think, the, is talking about Tijuana, but at least the process is not trying to represent Tijuana from my point of view in my contribution. It's more, uh, I assume my, pro, my work as a Tijuana work because I produce the work there and now, uh, now it's out of Tijuana. No? And the, the, the other maybe last thing is it's not easy always to talk about Tijuana in Tijuana. I think sometimes it's a little healthy to talk about Tijuana outside. Sometimes get too sick because they never went there.